Hip Hip Hooray, and welcome to a special of the British Broadcasting Century podcast. A surprise episode too, certainly a surprise to me. I had the next episode good to go and suddenly spotted there's a coronation. You may have spotted it in the listings. They don't come along very often, so I thought, well, let's have a special episode on how the Beeb has broadcast coronations in the past. We've had two on-air crownings thus far. Charles III's is the third. So it's not just been Charles's mum, but his granddad as well, who have been broadcast as they have been crowned. So we'll go back to 1937 and 1953. I'll even touch on some coronations before that, how they weren't quite broadcast, but did use technology to reach people in different ways. And we'll look at how, when and why Auntie had to step up and do things it had never done before in these broadcasting landmarks. God save the Beeb, it's a brief history of coronation broadcasts here on the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, hello, this is Paul Carenza calling. This is London Calling. Hello, hello, hip hip hooray, I'm Paul Carenza, and much as I was going to bring you an episode on Major Arthur Corbett Smith, that'll be next time, and soon, because the episode is good to go. But I thought, no, on this episode of the podcast on British Broadcasting Backstory, that is nothing to do with the BBC, by the way, solo project here, it's time for a special, a breeze through the last century or so of broadcast coronations. Whatever your view on the monarchy... The coronation is surely an event that you can't have failed to notice. And in part, that's because the national broadcaster goes into full swing, and it always has done, when there's a new head for the crown. First then, let's go back before the BBC began. In fact, we're going to go back three coronations before the BBC began, as early as we've ever gone back on this podcast, to Queen Victoria. 1838's ceremony was the last coronation of the 19th century and, like broadcasting, used a new innovation to get more people experiencing it than ever before. The railways. 400,000 people chugged their way into town to line the route and cheer her along. Victoria was also the first British monarch to be photographed, but that wasn't until after she was queen. 1902 was the next coronation, Edward VII. No broadcasting yet. Marconi was busy developing radio technology. We weren't quite at telephony at this point, though. It's a little bit confusing, this one, but Georges Méliès' The Coronation of Edward VII was released in 1902 on Coronation Day. Now, this isn't an actual recording of the coronation. It's a six-minute reconstruction of the event filmed before it had happened. The producer, Charles Urban, asked for permission to film the actual coronation ceremony or the procession, but was refused. So they decided to make this simulation film. And actually, it was a huge hit. Even Edward VII himself liked it, calling it Splendid! What a marvellous apparatus cinema is! It found a way of recording even the parts of the ceremony that didn't take place. The king may not quite have liked one idea that Georges Méliès had for this film. He originally planned to feature Queen Victoria as a ghost. Also crowned that day was Edward's wife Alexandra as Queen. Now She had a few links with radio. In December 1911, so nine years later, she used wireless telegraphy to send messages to a wrecked ship with fellow royals on. In 1920, she used wireless telephony with Marconi there himself in Chelmsford at the Melchior concert soon after Melba. We mentioned that, I don't know, about uh, 30 episodes ago here on the podcast. But yep, Queen Alexandra was there greeting Denmark before Melchior sang. As a princess, Alexandra gave her name to a certain North London entertainment venue, Alexandra Palace, Ali Pali, which of course after her death would become home to the world's first regular TV broadcasts when the BBC moved in. Now we reach 1911. Still no broadcast coronation then. George V's coronation. This was filmed for a newsreel, but just the parade. The ceremony is sacred and private. I'll put a link in the show notes to the silent YouTube video that you can see of George V's coronation. Again, though, this is not broadcasting. His coronation plans were, well, a little slapdash and chaotic, although George V wasn't doing the planning. That was the job of a hereditary peer, the Duke of Norfolk, who always has technically been in charge of such occasions as this. Now, on this occasion, the Duke of Norfolk himself did insist that it was his ancient right to plan the day. Unfortunately, though, he was terrible at planning things. Everything from seating position to errors in the orders of service were chaotic. A lot had to be redrafted the night before. 
What they needed was broadcasting to be invented, and then the BBC would come along and planning and order would be through it all like a stick of rock. In autumn 1922, the first Prince of the Air was the future Edward VIII at the first all-British wireless exhibition, helping to sell radio sets to the masses. 1923, Reith had asked permission to broadcast on the radio the wedding of the future George VI and Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, known to most of us by her other name, the Queen Mother. But no, Westminster said it would be disrespectful in 1923 to have this royal wedding broadcast. People could be listening in pubs with their hats on. That was genuinely the fear. The first king to broadcast as king was George V in 1924, and that's the earliest recording we still have of an event that was broadcast. My people in all parts of the world join to celebrate their unity and to draw closer the common ties which hold them together. See our episode on the history of archives for more on that. But a decade later, the next coronation. 1937 then, by this point, broadcasting was in full swing. Radio and even TV had now appeared. So the coronation of Edward VIII was planned, but he abdicated. His Royal Highness... Prince Edward. And now we all have a new king. And so they kept the same date for the coronation, and George VI had his coronation planned for this day instead. The BBC, of course, then wanted to broadcast it. The main organiser of the coronation was media-savvy Archbishop of Canterbury, Cosmo Lang, great name. And he was fielding questions from the media over how and what could be broadcast. In fact, the Archbishop of Canterbury was on the BBC a lot in the run-up to 1937's coronation, using this as a chance for a church campaign to lure people back to churches called Recall to Religion. He launched this on BBC Radio in December 1936. So a few months later the coronation comes along. The build-up to that then saw other radio reverends, including W. H. Eliot. Nobody can walk about London just now without thinking of the great event that is coming on the 12th of May. Everything is being prepared for a day of happiness and of hope. Now, it seems to me that this is the right attitude of mind, not only for a nation like ours in this special year, but for all of us as individuals, on any day of any week in any year. I was escorted into the audience room and found myself face to face with King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. Robert Wood was engineer in charge of outside broadcast. They knew what I was there for. Reith had arranged it all without telling me. His book, A World in Your Ear, tells of the coaching the new king needed for radio for reasons that Colin Firth would later make famous. The problem behind my visit was that the king had a lot of responses to make in the forthcoming coronation service and would also have to make a speech to the nation the same evening. It was widely known that he suffered from a very heavy stammer. It was now my job to help him minimise the effects of this in his broadcast. I began by doing rehearsals with the King, as he had always done them, standing up at a sort of high ledger desk. This was the way he had been coached by his speech therapist, who believed that standing helped him to speak more clearly. Little by little over the years, I managed to get him down until he was able to sit at ease at a desk like every other broadcaster. It was very difficult for me. I had to be very tactful because I was not a famous Harley Street specialist. I was only a specialist in microphones. It took time to overcome this and win his trust, but we did it. Over the years, he learned how to cope and eventually become a master of the microphone. As for coverage of the coronation, it was the most complicated broadcast the BBC had ever attempted. Engineer Robert Wood actually slept in the Abbey the night before in an old storeroom because BBC bosses were worried he may get run over or delayed getting there the next day and they couldn't do it without him. What my anxious superiors had forgotten was that the Abbey is just across the road from dear old Big Ben. All through the night, every 15 minutes, I was shattered by the crashing sound of the great clock chiming the quarters. I knew the sound well. It was I who had wired Big Ben up for broadcasting sometime before. The night before the coronation, King George VI himself broadcast live on the BBC. BBC. By this time then, we were four years into the King's Christmas message, so he knew this was a chance to reach the Empire. As for the Coronation Day itself, they had 472 miles of cable, 12 tonnes of kit, 58 microphones, 28 of them inside the Abbey. We did a nice little job of camouflaging microphones, hiding them in cheeks of masonry, under prayer stools, in chandeliers and lecterns. We even managed to tuck one into each arm of Edward the Confessor's chair, used for the actual enthronement, and put a third on its carved back. This is London. This was a shortwave retransmission by NBC to America. Today, in the hearing of an innumerable congregation of their subjects and of millions of listeners all over the world, 
Their Majesties King George the Sixth and Queen Elizabeth are to be crowned at Westminster Abbey. Stuart Hibbert giving the 1937 coronation opening announcement. And thank you to Random Radio Jottings and Andy Walmsley. We'll put the link to his clip in the show notes. We begin this broadcast by taking you, wherever you may be listening, to Buckingham Palace. The Royal Standard is flying over the palace and floating out in a slight breeze. John Snagg commentated, as he did at Elizabeth II's ceremony in 1953. So as Andy Wormsley has pointed out to me, Charles III's in 2023 is the first snaggless broadcast coronation. Maybe like Wogan and Eurovision, we should raise a toast to John Snagg in hymn nine, if there were that many. But back in 1937, John Snagg noted of that first broadcast coronation, all the commentators were as nervous as kittens because there was no rehearsal, but we came away with a feeling the broadcast had been pretty well done under the circumstances. This wasn't just the first coronation to be broadcast on radio, though. It was the first to be shown on television. It had only launched half a year earlier, but this was surely a chance to show to the Empire the pageantry and the grandeur, the first time that the monarch could be both seen and heard in the homes of his citizens. Of course, not many people had televisions at the time. Maybe 10,000 or so saw it broadcast live. But still, it was peacock strutting time. And that meant visuals. This was the BBC's first major televised outside broadcast. Cameras for the first time leaving Alexandra Palace, that building named after this new king's grandmother. Handily, the BBC filmed themselves filming it in televising the coronation procession. Now we've got three cameras working today and they're linked up to our new television vans, which transmit to the main transmitter at Alexandra Palace. Half of all of the BBC's cameras were used. That's three out of a total of six. To me, well, they look like something out of an H.G. Wells film. Yeah, they didn't have many cameras then. In fact, there's every chance that you have more cameras that could film in your house right now than the BBC had in 1937. We've got two of our cameras high up on the gate itself. So they had to learn to be clever, use these very few cameras, positioning them in the right place on corners of the procession. So they got two angles for the price of one. it's passed by us. The third one on the pavement is within some three or more feet of the royal coach as it comes by. And this is the one that will have the honour of televising their majesties for the first time. TV only got the procession. No cameras there for the ceremony at the Archbishop of Canterbury say so. Just as the king's carriage appeared, the TV kit broke down, so the engineer hit it all as hard as he could, and magically it worked again. His majesty... The king. The newly crowned King George VI spoke to the Empire. It is with a very full heart I speak to you tonight. Never before has a newly crowned king been able to talk to all his peoples in their own homes on the day of his coronation. Next day, the Daily Mail said, When the king and queen appeared, the picture was so vivid that one felt that this magical television is going to be one of the greatest of all modern inventions. I think they could be right, you know. With one last glimpse of the happy, excited crowds, reigning though it may be, we end our adventure of televising the coronation procession. But of course, it would take George VI's daughter to truly launch the medium of television to the world. Well, that being said, there are arguments that other things like sport was actually launching television to the world just as well. But either way, the role of the coronation was huge in the development of television. This coronation, of course, 1953, Elizabeth II, what they called the OB of all OBs. Another BBC reporter called it Sea Day, likening it to the military operation on the beaches less than a decade earlier. The moment of the Queen's crowning is near at hand. Before television, let's look at radio with John Snagg. The Dean of Westminster brings the crown. The Archbishop takes it from the crimson cushion. He raises it high in the sight of the people and reverently places it on the Queen's head 
Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, is crowned. In 1953, television had stopped for the war and started again in peacetime. They'd filmed big events like the 1948 London Olympics and the royal wedding of Princess Elizabeth, the future queen, to Prince Philip, even though, yes, people might be watching it in pubs wearing hats. By now, two million households had a TV licence, but the filming of the ceremony was still proving to be a sticking point. This time round, the new quote was, Might there be something unseemly in the chance that a viewer could watch this solemn and significant service with a cup of tea at his elbow? That's from The Year That Made the Day, a lovely old BBC book that I was sent by a kind podcast listener who shall remain anonymous, but thank you. Again, the BBC thankfully filmed themselves filming the coronation. Link in the show notes to that. Television clearly was going to be important for those who couldn't come to London themselves. The BBC mustered every outside broadcast camera it possessed to bring viewers live pictures of all the day's events. But the big question was whether permission would be granted to televise the service from inside Westminster Abbey. Well, Churchill was dead against it, so someone at the Beeb leaked the thoughts of him and the Cabinet to the press. The front pages cried privilege, and that helped make the government back down. The Queen, too, relented. She wasn't a big fan of having television cameras there, but she realised the importance of it, and she let them in, even though her advisers said no, keep the service private. But part of the deal was no cameras closer than 30 feet from the Queen. They really didn't want her visual expressions reaching out there into people's homes. But the palace were naive to the possibilities of zooming in. So Deputy OB boss Peter Dimmock shrewdly made sure that a wide-angle lens was on the camera when showing officials, but then he swapped it out for a zoom lens on the day. The result? Yes, the cameras were more than 30 feet from the Queen. They were very discreet and far back. But... Thanks to the Zoom, we got close-ups of the Queen. Unapproved beforehand, but later deemed the right call. They say that a beautiful picture is worthy of the finest frame. The coronation service could have had no finer setting than that of this Church of Kings. Richard Dimbleby was famously the chief commentator, and it's said that the way that his words dovetailed with those of the Archbishop of Canterbury was almost like Dimbleby was somehow conducting the service himself. This throne, like the raised floor of the theatre itself, is descended from those days 1,500 years ago when the early kings sat for their crowning upon a mound of earth and were then lifted high upon the shoulders of their nobles so that all the peoples might see them. Other commentators included Brian Johnston. Yes, Jonas, probably giggling about a rude cricketer's name or something. And forget three cameras like the previous coronation. The BBC now used 20 cameras for Elizabeth II. There were 41 languages, 95 commentary locations, interest from across the Commonwealth and across the world. There were tele-recordings, helicopters on standby to take the footage across the Atlantic. There were large screens set up so that people could go and watch this broadcast. Places like London's Festival Hall, where 3,000 tickets were put on sale and sold out within 54 minutes. It had a scope and scale that no television broadcast had ever had. When I spoke to you last at Christmas, I asked you all, whatever your religion, to pray for me on the day of my coronation. Roger Bolton, formerly of Feedback, now of Roger Bolton's Bee Watch podcast, recalls watching it. We got a 12-inch telly for the 53 coronation and had all our family in the front room and we were the only ones who had it. It was black and white, but it was so small that you had to buy, or if you did, it could buy as well, a magnifying glass that went in front of it. The problem about that was if you looked head on, that was fine, but if you looked like from the side or underneath, where, of course, I sat as a seven or eight-year-old boy, all the royal families had large noses. It's actually <laughs> like going one of those fun fairs where the mirrors exaggerate. Oh, yes, yes. But yes, that was the moment that television really came home. As well as Roger Bolton, 20 million viewers watched it for the first time outnumbering radio listeners. Far more watched across the world. 85 million Americans watched the highlights. The book, The Year That Made the Day, ends with reports from across the world of the coronation broadcasts. This from a petty officer on board the British submarine, Andrew, which picked up the coronation broadcasts during her underwater Atlantic crossing. My biggest thrill was being awakened one morning by a fanfare of trumpets. I couldn't make out what it was at first, then I realised we were hearing the coronation broadcast from the Abbey. 
This from Sydney in New South Wales, watching a recording. Coronation ceremony reception fair improving to good approximately 1300 GMT and thereafter. Service completely intelligible, but music marred continuous surge. Long live Queen and coronation across world reception good. Her Majesty Queen, Churchill good. Like the shipping forecast. And this from Malaya. Abbey service, absolutely perfect reception. Every cough and footstep, every emotional break in commentator's voice, faultless. And this from RTF Paris. Very urgent quality image passable departure from Buckingham Palace, excellent, from 10.30, stop. Sound perfect, stop. Public crowding round public receiving sets and cinema halls, full, stop. Reactions enthusiastic, stop. Bravo. And she wears, as we see her now, the imperial state crown. In her hands, the scepter and the rod. The sign that in her hands, justice and mercy are never to be separated. So that was 1953. Flash forward to the present day then. In 2023, we have another coronation. Luckily, Georges Méliès, that early filmmaker, isn't around to film this coronation, or the ghost of the previous monarch may make an appearance. Not just radio and TV, but now online, on digital. You can probably ask your smart speaker to play it if you want to. You can certainly ask it to play the national anthem. And to show how far we've come, even I am hosting a live stream of a concert at the Royal Albert Hall on the night of Coronation Day. Yes, there are so many cameras, outlets and streaming facilities. Even I get to present something about it. That's not for the BBC, though, because there are concerts, not just the official one, but others linked to it, documentaries, commentaries, TikToks, probably. But as for the ceremony itself, that's what it's all about, of course. And yep, there is still a private solemn section where we won't get to see it. Charles is anointed with ointment. That bit the cameras don't get to see. And in one interesting broadcasting quirk, there's a multi-faith element that won't be audible in 2023's coronation because it includes the chief rabbi and it takes place on the Sabbath and Jewish law prohibits the use of electricity on the Sabbath, including microphones. So even now, when you film a religious service, there are limits. And quite right too. I don't know that we should see everything. And as we've seen across this episode, it's only in recent coronations that we could see anything at all. So there you go. That's a whiz through. A century plus, I suppose, of broadcast or recorded coronations. Thank you for listening. God save the king, or if you're Republican, insert your own preferred chant here. There we go, we left a space for you. This has been a special of the British Broadcasting Century podcast. If you enjoy it, do share it, rate, review. We're on patreon.com slash Paul Carenza, where you get extra writings and videos, or one-off tips are always welcome at coffee.com, ko-fi.com slash Paul Carenza, if you think this podcast is worth something. <laughs> Sniff. Hey, we can't all be kings. Next time, then, it's back to the non-specials, our regular moment-by-moment timeline of 1923, telling the origin story of the BBC with the tale of a unique part pioneer, not the Prince of Wales, but the first station director of Wales, Major Arthur Corbett Smith. It's a bizarre and brilliant tale. Subscribe if you haven't. Don't miss it. The British Broadcasting Century is presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. Nothing to do with the BBC, you know. Original music is by Will Farmer. BBC content is used with kind permission. BBC copyright content reproduced courtesy of the British Broadcasting Corporation. All rights reserved. Any Crown content is Crown copyright. Sometimes it's a little confusing to find out whose is whose. Though generally, any broadcasts over 50 years old are beyond copyright. Stay informed, educated, entertained and subscribed. And join us next time for the tale of Arthur Corbett Smith back in 1923. A rather unusual pioneer the other end of this British Broadcasting Century. The British Broadcasting Century is going to bed now, so there now follows the national anthem. Good night. Please stand. The coronation is over. I thank you. I thank you all. From my heart. From a full heart.